Welcome to The Human Experience, a podcast about the stories we live out every day and the importance of championing the vulnerability and courage of the storyteller. I'm your host, Jennifer Peterkin, and it was through my own lived story of walking through domestic violence that this podcast was created. Through traveling the globe and interviewing each guest in person, I am convinced now more than ever that stories have the power to change the world. You can join our community of storytellers by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, signing up for my newsletter, following me on Instagram, and more. Thank you for being here. In a world full of noise, to listen with intention is an act of resistance. So I'm homeless, I'm jobless, I don't know what we're going to do, I don't have any insurance. And my husband had gone in and cleaned out the retirement account two different times without telling anybody. So there's really no retirement in there. And we're not getting any younger. And I'm reeling at that point. And I'm like, I don't even know how we're going to recover. Episode 38 of The Human Experience is part two of Julie's story. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I highly recommend doing that first. To recap, Julie grew up in an abusive home and got married straight out of high school to try and escape. But it wasn't as easy to leave all of that behind as she had thought. Julie's struggles continued, from relationship hardships to injury and illness and everything in between. And every time she thought she was finally turning a corner, the rug would be pulled out from under her again. But of course, Julie's story doesn't end there. This episode was recorded in Dallas, Texas. A brief content warning before we begin, this episode contains conversations around abuse. So, all of our children are grown. My youngest son graduated from high school in 2011. My dad was diagnosed with cancer in 2010. And my son graduated from high school, and he goes off to college, and in March of 2012, my husband comes in, and we're talking, and we'd gone through some rocky times in our 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 little town that we were raising our kids in. My son had been really, really sick from his sophomore year to his senior year. Your youngest son. My youngest son. And um, they were checking him for lymphoma cancer. Um, He had lost 35 pounds that he didn't have to lose. They had gone in and and removed his tonsils that were super infected, and then they did a biopsy to check for cancer, and we still didn't know what was wrong with him. We couldn't figure it out. And finally, it came back the third time they checked checked him for mono. He had mono, but he had mono so bad that he um, was diagnosed with hepatitis. So he wasn't even able to get his booster shot to go to school. And so then we had a coach that had an axe to grind with our baseball coach. And my boys were both baseball players. They were both all-state baseball players. So we spent a lot of time at the baseball field and at the gym. And all my kids were athletes. And so here we are, and he's gone through this rocky time. And then the athletic director decides all these boys that are going into baseball season are going to start lifting weights like the football players, and all of them end up with hurt backs because of the fact that this athletic director is mad at the baseball coach. And he's wanting to get rid of the baseball coach. And all these kids get caught in the middle. And so mom goes to school, me being mom. I go to (laughs) school one day, and I say, you've got two doctor's notes. Why are you sending my son to the weight room? I can do whatever I want to. And I said, no, sir, not with my son. You cannot. Next thing I know, I leave school. He slams the door and he fires the baseball coach on the spot. And this is my son's junior year. My son blames me. All the baseball team is reeling. We're going into our season. And my son blames me. And we kind of get ostracized in the community. Oh, my word. Because I stood up for my son because I didn't want him. I, I mean, we'd just gotten him healthy. Yeah. Why are you Why are you doing this? And so we literally get ostracized in the community. And there's one other family that, are, that get the baseball son's family 
is in that. And so we become, you know, we do everything. We kind of do everything with them because nobody else is speaking to us at that point. And the husband that got fired, he moves on with the younger son. But the older son, who is Justin's age, they're juniors at this point. He's on on target to be the valedictorian. If he leaves there, he loses all of his scholarships. So he and his mom stay there. And his mom is a dear friend of mine to this day. And so we just kind of begin to become, you know, it's our, I mean, they're the only people we hang out. We go to the ball field and we kind of have to sit over with the, the school cops sitting there hoping we don't say anything or do anything. And everybody else is over there. And we've been friends and playing ball with these families, you know, since these guys were 11. And so that's what we had walked through. So we were ready to leave shallow water after our son graduated. And so we put our house on the market on a Thursday, on Friday morning, the very first people that look at our house make an offer on our house. And I get a phone call about one thirty or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and my husband goes, come get me, I'm done. I'm like, I beg your pardon. I'm pretty sure I did not hear you correctly. What did you say to me? Come get me, I'm done. Well, he had gotten into a fight with the general manager at the at work. They'd had a disagreement, and he marched into the office. He goes, if y'all are going to treat me like this, here's my keys. And they said, okay. So there goes all of our insurance, the company car, and our house just sold. At that point, my husband and I have been married for 28 years. And I go in to pack up my house, and it represents everything that we've walked through. And he lied to me one more time. And I start packing my house, and I fall apart. And every time I try to pack my house, I fall apart. Because all of a sudden, I'm working a part-time job at that point due to my health. And I no longer have a business because I'd lost my business because of the last time that he just quit a job. And then I had three surgeries after that. And I felt like an utter and total failure. So when you moved back to Lubbock, uh-huh. you, you lost your business after that? When I moved back to Lubbock, I hurt my back moving. And in the next 18 months, I had three surgeries. So I had moved my business in, you know, in about less than a three-year period, I had moved two, three times, and two of those times were over 400 miles each. And then I had three surgeries. For your back? The, well, one was my back, okay. one was my hand, and one was a total hysterectomy. Oh, my gosh. Total hysterectomy, which threw me into full-blown menopause at 34 years old. And I felt like a failure. I felt like I should have been able to do more. I should have been able to be more. Uh, There should have been something I could do. I never, ever, I never, ever pointed that in anybody else's direction. I pointed it all inward. There should have been something I could do. And now I look back on it, you know, how as you get healthy and hindsight's twenty twenty. Now I look back on it. I don't know if anybody could have been able to maintain all of that with all of that going on. I'm going to tell you right now that no. I mean, I no. But I felt like an utter and total failure that I should have been able to do more. I should have been able to, you know, the shoulda, woulda, coulda sure, is sure. like kick our tail. Well, it kicked my tail. So I didn't have that business anymore. But the beauty of that is, is I was able to go to work for the lady who had been my mentor and who had been above me, who was a national sales director, she called me one day and she said, Julie, would you be willing to be my assistant in my office? That was the first person in my entire life that had ever believed in me. That was the first person that had ever spoken life to me. That was the first person that had ever advocated for me in my entire life. Wow. I don't think she has any idea Hmm. how much her relationship meant to me because it was the first I'd ever experienced in my whole life. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. No Please apologies. For that. Please no apologies. I still necessary. love her and we are still we are still dear friends, even though we don't see each other very often. But she called me and she said, Would you come and work in my office? Mm-hmm. And so I was working for her part time. 
You know, so I wasn't bringing home a whole lot of money at that point. But I mean, you know, that part-time income was great and it was enough for what we needed. And it gave me the freedom and flexibility to be a mom Mm -hmm. and be at all of my my kids' things, which was the reason I had always done everything I had done was I wanted to be a mom first. I didn't want anybody else raising my children. That was important to me. And so I'm working for her at that point. We have no insurance. We have my car. And my husband lost his car and all of that. And come to find out in the whole scheme of things, all of that argument had transpired an hour and a half before. My husband had never called me and given me a heads up to know that they'd had an argument and for me to talk him off of the mountain. But he'd also never, ever really taken care of any of the bills or any of this is how you qualify for anything. He didn't understand any of that. So here we had just sold our house. So I'm homeless. I'm jobless. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't have any insurance. And that's and my husband had gone in and cleaned out the retirement account two different times without telling anybody. Oh. So there's really no retirement in there. And we're not getting any younger. And... I, I'm reeling at that point, and I'm like, I don't even know how we're going to recover. And so I finally look at him, and I say, you know what? You lied. You didn't keep your promise. I can't do this anymore. You get to deal with the consequences of your choices. You're going to pack the house. You're going to figure it out. Well, you wanted to move. I said, yeah, and now we can't. Well, what do you mean we can't? I said, we won't qualify for a house now. Yeah, we will. And I said, you can't qualify for a house when you don't have a job. So how are we going to move? And I said, and then when people start checking your references to be able to rent a place, you have to provide income information. How are you going to do that? I'll get another job. It'll be fun. He had no prospects. And at that point, I pack up my basic minimums, and I had a friend that said, you can come and stay with me. Hmm. I go, first interview I have, they hired me to go to work at a bank. And I go, and I said, here's the thing. You made this mess. Don't call my family and don't call our children You call your friends, you call your relationships to help you clean this up. Well, guess what he did? First phone call was to my mother and daddy. My mother and daddy feel sorry for him. They go and buy him a car and they put it in his name. I have the truck that has a $750 a month payment (gasps) and it's in my name because my credit was better. And I have that payment, and he has a brand new, or not a brand new car. He has a car that my parents had bought him. It was a nice little car. He has no payments, and they put it in his name, and my parents didn't understand why why I was hurt. I was hurt, number one, that he'd even called him. And they're like, we were just trying to help you out. Well, one more time, it just felt like that they were looking out for everybody but me, and nobody was asking me what the problem was and what was going on. Nobody ever asked me ever. And then the next phone call was, your mom's not here, and I've got to pack the house, and I can't do it by myself. Well, my daughter worked in my sister's Her husband was an optometrist, and she worked in their office. And so he's calling her at work. So my daughter resents the fact that she's coming and having to do mom's job. And my sister resents the fact of the matter that if my sister would step up to the plate, my employee wouldn't be getting phone calls like this that tear her up all the time at work. But nobody ever once called me and said, what's going on with you? What's the deal? Not a one of them. The next phone call was to my boys. Hey, I got some heavy stuff I need you to help me with. So they're all over there. So all my stuff got thrown in a box. Nothing was wrapped. Things were broken. Things that were irreplaceable were broken in the move and the whole nine yards. And they go and they put everything in storage. And I'm just to the point, I'm like, whatever. For six months. I didn't hear from any of my family. I didn't hear from any of my children. 
It was me and God. And thank goodness, when you get like that, God shows up and God shows out. And he held me close and he loved me through it. And he showed me things about his character and he showed me things about himself and who I was. And looking back on that, I wouldn't trade for that time because it taught me an awful lot. And it was okay to let Ricky deal with consequences of choices that he'd made. Not only was it okay, it was God's blessing. Yeah, it was necessary. You have to love me anyway, because I've never, ever told this story out loud. Love you anyway. I adore Um, you. Oh, my uh, goodness. Anyway, and so in this season, I'm working for the bank, and Ricky says, okay, I'll go to counseling with you. And so we go to counseling, and we go to counseling together a couple of times. And um, then finally, the counselor goes, I want to see him by himself. And he goes, well, I don't know what that's about. And um, so the counselor sees him by himself, and he comes back. And you remember I said the one thing I always wanted to do right was my family. And he is a good man. There's so many good things about him. We just had to learn how to communicate and how to be a team. And he didn't know how to be anybody's team. He just didn't. And I didn't know how to ask for what I needed very well either. We both were operating out of very flawed systems from where we the baggage we'd brought from our childhood did not serve either one of us well at all Mm. and so we got back together we put our marriage back together we found a house to rent a year later we bought another house and three weeks into that my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer and at this point this is 2013 and my dad's prostate cancer had progressed I got both of those phone calls in a 24-hour period My husband's phone call came in on his 50th birthday. And so then we start going through the process that you go through, you know, to deal with prostate cancer and all of the things. And I'm still working at the bank. And, you know, and at that point, just trying to juggle all of it and do all of the things. And and Ricky had, you know, gotten a great job and gone back to work for, you know, a great company. And and so we're kind of just putting the pieces back together and, And so the goal that we'd had, you know, two years before, we kind of are beginning to be able to kind of put it back together. Yeah. And um, so, you know, we're we're living in that house and doing all of the things. And so this is 2013, and we kind of progress and and dealing with his issues and all of that was a lot. And then I transferred into a different department at work. And you know how in the banking industry, you know, sometimes you kind of have some of those mean girls that are in there a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, we kind of had some of those in there. And, you know, and I transferred from one location to another location. And the first location I was at was amazing, but I was on my feet all the time. And you remember that surgery that I had, those three surgeries and learning to walk all the time, and I'm on my feet all the time, and I'm having a lot of swelling, and I'm having a hard time, you know, just being able to be on my feet. So we transferred to a, to a different department that I could, you know, not be on my feet all the time. And just basically, I had a boss that kind of zeroed in, you know, and I'm like, okay, and I don't fight mean girl very well. I don't play mean girl very well. Mm-hmm. I just don't. And I didn't realize what she was doing. I'm going to just say this. She was a lot like the mother that I've always known, a little passive aggressive. And then I don't know what her problem is and push your button. And when you respond, she's like, I don't know why you responded. So anyway, so um, all that's taking place. And so my dad is getting worse. And I finally, I finally decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave this position at this point. And I'm sure that God has something else for me, but I'm, I'm not staying here. And my health, it was taking a toll on my health. And so I walked away from that. And so in uh, 2015, two of my children decide to get married in the fall of 2015. And at this point, my dad is getting really, really bad. Mm. And so in October, my first son, on October the 2nd, my first son gets married. And they have an out-of-town wedding. And it was the last time I really remember seeing my daddy just cut up and have fun and he had a rough time making the trip and all of that but he was there and my daughter had been dating a young man and I mean right after the wedding he asked her right after the married wedding in October he asked my daughter to marry him and my daughter says mom I really want my papa at my wedding and I said I understand and she said is there any way we can do it by December 
So here we've just had a wedding in October, <laughs> and then we're going to have another wedding in December. And I keep going to the doctor thinking I have an upper respiratory infection, and I just am like, I'm not feeling well. I'm having a lot of swelling in that leg, but that leg had swollen off and on all these years, and it's just kind of cranky anyway because, you know, when they put you back together and tell you you'll never walk again, it doesn't ever work quite like it's supposed to. Sure. And so we get all that done. And we get all of them married. My dad's able to be there in his shiny, bright 1950 red truck. And my daughter and son-in-law sit in the back of it to leave the church. And it was just it was just a really sweet time. But my dad was doing really bad. And so I get to go and spend the day with my dad on the 28th of January of 2016. We go and just spend the day. I take him and a friend to the lake. And then I drop the friend off. And... We just had a sweet time, and that's the first time I ever remember having one-on-one time with my dad as a grown, as a grown woman, just one-on-one, just the two of us. Wow. And he turns around, and he looks at me, and I'm going to get really emotional about this because I never remember hearing my dad say this. He looks at me, and he says, I love you more than you'll ever, ever know. Mm. Wow. Sorry. No apologies. This is the first time I've ever told my story out loud. And you would think, you know, as old as I am, because I'm not telling how old I am, but I'm old. (laughs) I'm old enough to, to, you know, I've gotten through all this a long time ago. But God's good. He uses all of it. But I love you more than you will ever, ever know. It's the first time I ever heard that in my whole adult life. From my dad. Good grief. Sorry. No, please. Um, You're fine. So the fact that I remember the date is hysterical to me because I'm terrible with dates. But (laughs) that was the 28th of January of 2016. And that few hours that I got to spend with my dad will forever be a treasure to me. But he grabs my hand and holds my hand and says, I love you more than than you will ever, ever know. February the 17th of 2016. We um, have a meeting at my brother's company with the hospice coordinator to put my dad on hospice because he's, he's to the point that we've got to have some help, and, and he's not doing well at all. So we have that meeting, and I'm huffing and puffing, and it, my sister goes, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I don't feel good. And so I leave from there, and thank God we have one of those wonderful little town doctors that just, you know, and I go, and I walk in, and I'm going, I cannot breathe. And so I'm seeing his little nurse practitioner, and she goes, Julie, this has kind of been an issue for a while. We've been treating you for this, like, since last July. I don't know what's going on with you. Let me run some blood work. And so they take some blood work, and they, you know, I mean, like, we're talking like, 15 vials of blood and I'm not going vampire (laughs) and and so I go home from there and I'm like okay I'm gonna just go lay down for a little while I just don't feel very good so at 8 30 that night I get a call saying you need to go to the emergency room and I said can I go to a doc in the box and they go (laughs) uh no you need to go to the emergency room well at that point all the hospitals in Lubbock were full and they were all on diversion here there and everywhere and so I go to this the smallest hospital because I'm like, I'm not waiting at one of the big hospitals. They took great care of my dad when he had a deal. I'm going to that hospital. So we go there, and I don't know what they're looking for. Well, they had done a test on me. It's called a D-dimer, and it's supposed to be like 247 is high. Well, mine was like 8,500. So I get to the hospital, and they go, I think you've got a false test. So they do another arterial D-dimer, and at that point, it's 11,300. And what is this that they're testing for? A D-dimer tests for blood clots. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so they go, I guess it wasn't a false test. So at that point, they whisk me off, to, they whisk me off and they start doing x-rays on me. And then they bring me back, and the next thing I know, they're strapping oxygen on me and putting an IV in and all the things, and nobody's told me yet what they're testing for or what they're doing. Well, it comes back that I had extensive blood clots in both lungs. Like, my lungs were white. And so I'm like, okay. 
And they said, and we don't know if our hospital can do this, so we may have to send you to another hospital, but we're going to go ahead and get you on oxygen, and then if we have to transport you, we'll transport you by ambulance. And I'm like, well, I walked in here. Well, you know, me being me, (laughs) I walked in here. And so I don't know what they're doing. And so, and I don't know what a D-dimer is for at that point, Yeah, but I find out real quick. (laughs) And so they say, oh, there's no other hospital we can take you to. So I had to call our director and he said, well, our only option is to keep her because we can't send her home. So they admit me at that point, and they start giving me blood blood thinner. And the nurse said, this is the highest dosage of blood thinner I've ever seen given in all of my years of nursing. You know, and my husband is clueless. At, when they finally told me what was going on, I went, oh, that's not good. Mm-hmm. My husband's clueless at that point. He has no clue. Until we go to the doctor the next week, and they sent me to the same doctor that had been treating my dad for cancer. He was also... He was a blood specialist as well as a cancer doctor. So they sent me to him, and he said, do you understand that there's only about a 5% chance that your wife should still be, or less chance that she should still be sitting here? He says, I don't normally talk to anybody who has that problem. They don't normally live. My husband's eyes got big as saucers. And at that point, they just, they start, you know, treating me for that and put me on blood thinners. But I'm in the hospital for, you know, uh, from the 17th until the Saturday after that, and my dad takes a turn for the worse. And I literally have to beg them to let me out of the hospital so that I can go and be with my dad. And they say, if you have trouble breathing at all, you go immediately back to the emergency room. And I'm like, okay. And so none of my family, they're all grieving the process with my dad. Nobody really understands how sick I truly am. Everybody's just focused on on my dad and even my husband I got when we go to the hospital that or to the doctor the next week to see the doctor that's when he told us about all of that Mm -hmm. and I'm still not doing well my dad is doing horrible he goes I didn't know I was going to become the family doctor here (laughs) and um but he was an awesome awesome man and he treated me great and then on March the 17th on St. Patty's Day, which I think is just so funny because my dad was such a jokester. St. Patty's Day is the day that God took my daddy home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thankful for the minutes that we had with him. But at that point, I'm still really sick. And it took me really and truly two years to feel like myself. And my mom is creating division with my children and, and us. You know, and she's still doing kind of her thing and and all the things and telling my kids, you know, well, your mom wasn't there to help when Papa was so sick. Nobody really at that point realizes how sick I am. So come Christmas time, we'd always had the tradition of we would go to my parents for Christmas morning about 10 o'clock and everybody would come and we'd have pigs in the blanket and gravy. If you're from West Texas, you, you know. The South, we like our gravy. (laughs) And everybody would come for Christmas. Well, that year, everybody bucked up and decided, well, Papa's not here and we're not going. And they didn't, and my kids didn't want to come to our house either because my mom had said, well, your mom didn't help with your wedding and your mom didn't this. And I don't know why your mom didn't help. And so she's just kind of doing her thing to, you know, put herself in the position that, you know, all of my kids, after my dad died, my kids took care of my mom's place. They did all of her mowing. My children went and took and got my dad out of bed every day. Mm-hmm. When he couldn't get out of bed, my boys were at her, my mom's beck and call. And so they didn't want to have Christmas that year. And then finally I said, you know, I almost died when Papa almost died. And I said, I'm having a real hard time with the way y'all are behaving. Who do you think established these traditions? And my kids go, why didn't anybody tell us you were that sick? Everybody was grieving my dad. Mm-hmm. And and then everybody's mad about, why didn't you tell us you were that sick? And I'm like, well, you know, I didn't think I had to tell you I was that sick. And so so it took me two years to feel like myself. Wow. And then I'm looking at, okay, God, if you're, you know, if you left me here, I want to finish strong. And I went to life coaching school, still trying to fix me, because that's what I do. I must be the problem. <laughs> at the end of 
uh, in the fall of 2016, after losing my granddad in July, in the fall of 2016, I went to life coaching school. And all of a sudden, I didn't know what it was. I went to support a friend. And as I'm sitting in that class, all of a sudden, all those Bible studies that I'd walked through, all of that freedom ministry for 20 years of learning how to overcome trauma and abuse and shame and regret and all the things, and all of the time spent working with Zig Ziglar and John Maxwell and all of these people, all of a sudden, that life coaching certification school was the thing that glued all those weird pieces that didn't (laughs) seem like they went together all together because you know I'd been through counseling through the years Mm -hmm. and I'd been through pastoral counseling and I'd been to bible studies and I'd I'd been trying to fix me for forever and figure out what it was about me that was broken and all of a sudden as I sat there and I listened to him life coach Life coaching is so different from counseling. It helps people look forward and look at all the things that are right with them instead of what is wrong with them and help them figure out a way to navigate a way forward. And I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. (laughs) And it makes all the things fit together. Mm. And I'm like, I love this. And so the next thing I know is randomly all these people start coming to me or being referred to me and they go, you have a natural gifting for this. You just hit that out of the park. And they have me do a demonstration in front of the class and they go, wow, (laughs) I've been doing this for a long time and I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all I was doing was what I do is I just love knowing about people's story. Mm -hmm. I love knowing what makes them tick. And I just love having a front row seat to see seeing whatever it is that God's doing. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of life coaching and I never <laughs> have a business card. And so I'm like, OK, I, I think I want to do some life coaching and I think I want to get certified because there's something about hang, having that certificate hanging on the wall mm-hmm. kind of a thing. And it's funny what God does in those seasons, you know, and. So I get to do a little bit of that. And so as I move forward on my journey, I think, okay, God gave me a second chance and I want to finish strong. And I am way overweight. I'm having blood pressure issues. Uh, I'm not feeling well. I have this leg that I'm having problems with and we move and we move into this house and my mother wants to bless me and my mother blessed me with our old house that we had raised our children in. They had bought it when we moved to Waco. But what she didn't do is she didn't tell us that the water was contaminated by the Air Force Base that is close to us because she wouldn't let them test it until after we closed. She didn't tell us that it was contaminated. She didn't tell us that there was a good probability that there were termites. She just told us that she wanted to bless us and she wanted to give it give it to us below market. And we just thought, oh, well, you know, and she wanted to help us be able to pay off some medical bills so that as we kind of start looking at being able to retire, we, you know, we would have the ability to do that. And so we move into this house and we've already moved in and already put our really nice house that I loved on the market to move back into that house and all of a sudden we realize all of that's going on and we find out the day that we closed that the water's contaminated. Oh. And my granddaughter had been drinking that water when she came to my house. And I was devastated on how on earth can you hide something like that from us? I let my granddaughter drink oh. that water. How could you let any of us drink that water? Is there something up with you that we need to know about that that's okay? And We finally had to have a conversation with my brother and my sister and my mom. And, you know, and I said, you need to understand that legally we could sue her and we would win. Mm -hmm. But it's not the right thing to do. We will not do that. But in the process of moving into that house, I finished off my leg. That leg that they pieced together all those years ago. I mean, you know, we're 30-something years in now. And so... 
I go to a doctor and he goes, I won't touch you with a 10 foot pole with you having all of the blood clot issues. So I go to three different doctors and nobody will touch me. And I finally find this little wonderful little doctor who's about, I don't know, he's 70 or 80 years old. And he goes about 20 years ago, I was told I was supposed to help people that no one else will help Mm. and come to find out he builds, builds bones for people whose bones have been eaten up by cancer. And he is over the whole orthopedic um, department at UMC. And he said, I can help you. And so he does a knee replacement on me in September of 2018. So I have to learn how to walk again for the fourth time in my life. And I, I, I do that. And I, I, it takes me little, it takes me about a year and a half to finally be able to walk well and have all the swelling done. And, but I feel like I've gotten a second chance at life. And when he was closing me up, he goes, young lady, not many people surprised me. He said, but you did. And I went, well, go figure. I don't do anything halfway and I don't do anything normal. So he said, as I was getting ready to close you up, he says, I'm rinsing it all out, and there's a bone shard that's the size of both of my thumbs put together that was hiding in the back of your knee that comes floating out. And I went, oh, my gosh. Well, you remember those blood clots I had in my lung? They had originated behind that bad (gasps) knee. That's where they had started. Oh, my word. And probably that piece of bone that came floating out that he was fixing to sew up in there, thank you, Jesus, that he rinsed it out one more time and bent it one more time and out it came floating before he closed it all up. It was probably the source of all of those blood clots. And so a year and a half later, I'm finally able to walk better than I've walked in 30 years. And I decide, okay, I've got to get this weight off or I, you know, I'm not going to be able to chase my grandkids. I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do. And that's important to me because, you know, I've got three kids that I birthed and three kids that I gained by them. And now I have four beautiful grandchildren. And Mm -hmm. by golly, I want to chase them and chase them hard. So I decided I pulled one of my husband's stunts. I did some research and all the things. And I said, okay, I can go and I can have weight loss surgery. And I had looked into it probably 15 years prior. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do something, I'm not going to be here. And so I looked into it and I found out that I could go to Tijuana, Mexico and have weight loss surgery for less than what it would cost me for my deductible. And I had several friends that had gone and they had connected me with this amazing doctor. I'd been in contact with him on Facebook. I'd been watching all the videos. I'd been studying all the things. And I decided I'm going to Tijuana, Mexico. And I'd started saving my money and I'd put it back, but I hadn't told anybody. And so finally I sat down with my husband and I said, okay, I've made a decision. I said, I have decided that I'm going to go to Tijuana, Mexico, and I'm going to have weight loss surgery. I'm going to have the gastric sleeve done so that I can be here and see my kids grow up and get my blood pressure down and lose the weight that I need to lose. And he goes, uh, okay. Okay. He said, have you done your research? He goes, that's a dumb question. I know you. You've done your research. (laughs) I said, I have done my research. And so I do all of this because it's for the first time in my life. It's the very first decision that I really feel like it was like a really huge, huge decision that I made all on my own. And I was determined it was going to happen one way or the other. And I said, here's the thing. They can do it next week. And I really want to do it. And I've saved the money and put the money back to go and do it. And I I really want your blessing. I said, but whether I have your blessing or not, this is something I need to do for me. He goes, what if you die? And I said, if I die on the table, I'll die on my terms. Mm. And I said, I'm dying already with the things I've got going on. And if I don't do something, I'm not going to be here. I said, so you've got to trust God and you've got to trust me that I did my research and you've got to trust that God's got this. So I head to Mexico and I have my surgery and all of that. And I've released 120 extra pounds. Wow, good for you. And I mean, it's the best thing I ever did for me in my entire life. 
And I did it in twenty one in twenty twenty of all the crazy things. You remember what was going on in twenty twenty? Oh, and I, I sure got do. on an airplane <laughs> and flew to Mexico in twenty twenty. Well, in the fall of twenty twenty one, I've gotten rid of one hundred and twenty pounds, and I'm down to about the last fifteen or twenty pounds that I need to get rid of. And I've been diligent, and I and I feel better, and I'm excited about what's going on. Well, I had had a lump for in my groin area for like a couple of years. The doctor wasn't really worried about it at all. Well, it had gotten a little tender, and I'm like, okay, well, that lump that we looked at a couple of years ago that we could never seem to get insurance to get their stuff together, and we could never get all the appointments together and all of that, and they never could get it checked. I said, I really feel like we need to check it again. I said, it's just tender every now and then, and, you know, and I guess with all the weight loss, it felt like it was a little bit, you know, bigger or whatever. I don't know if it was or it wasn't, and they said, okay, well, we still... Six months, We it took us six months even that time to try and finally get insurance to finally check on it. And so we go in, and they're going to, re- and, the, and the surgeon said, you know, he said, I really think it's just a sebaceous cyst, but I don't like how big it is, and I don't like how hard it is, and I would just feel better if we got it out. And I said, okay, let's do it. He said, because of where it is, it's important that we do that. So we go in and we do that. Well, it comes back a really rare form of cancer that is prominent in black women. What? And first of all, I'm a very tall, white woman. And this cancer, nobody had heard of it in Lubbock, Texas. And I said, and we've got two great big cancer centers. It is that rare. Oh, my goodness. I mean, like, unheard of. And so we go in and they try to get it and they don't get it all. And I said, well, I've got this other place on the other leg that's been there for forever. And they say it, they say that it's, it's nothing to worry about either. And I said, but in light of this, do you think we might ought to look at it and check it? And they said, well, I think based on what you're doing and the way you do things, let's go ahead and take it out and remove it. We'll come to find out it was the same type of cancer on the opposite leg, which is having it in multiple, this cancer in multiple locations is unheard of. Oh my gosh. It's a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans and nobody had ever heard of it in Lubbock, Texas. So they don't know what to do with me and they don't know what to do with the fact of the matter that it's in several, in multiple sites. And so... The second surgery, we get all of the one that's on the opposite leg, but we don't get all of the one that's on the original leg. So they have to go in for a third surgery. Oh, my goodness. And so they take out an area in my inner groin area, kind of there, the size of a four by six that's two inches deep. So he said, I did all the things, and I had to make three flaps to get you closed back up. You know, and I'm like, oh, my word. And he goes, but we finally got it all. And then they send me back and they send me over to the oncologist. And my oncologist and my surgeon are talking on their cell phones in the room with me there. That's unheard of. And so I go back to see the oncologist. And he said, Julie, he said, we didn't get quite as much margin as we wanted to. He says, but with the kind of surgery it is, I think we just need to watch it. I said, okay, we'll just watch it. Well, the next day they had had a meeting of their peers in the oncology department at the cancer center. And he calls me back. He goes, Julie, he says, in talking to my peers, he says, the radiology oncologist wants to see you because we're not sure that we don't need to do radiation on that place. He says, can you be in his office at one o'clock? I said, okay, I'll be in his office at one o'clock. So I go into his office, and he looks at the place, and he goes, now, what did this look like originally? And I tell him, and he said, and I've read all the notes. He goes, I don't know how they got that closed up that well. He says, because that was a really big, big area that he had to take out. And he said, and I've been talking to all my peers all over the country, and we don't really know whether we should do radiation or whether we shouldn't. And I said, well, here's the thing. I said, 
what are the side effects of radiation? And you tell me the side effects of radiation. And based on where it is, they would be radiating up into all of my organs. And then on the other place, they would be radiating into the prosthetic leg that was designed and created for me. And I said, based on the complications that you're telling me, I said, I'm seeing the dermatologist several times a year. And I said, and I'm just going to trust God with the rest. I said, because it sounds to me like the risk versus the benefit, the risk is way more than the benefit would ever be. Mm. And I said, so I'm going to help you make that decision. And I'm going to say, let's watch it. And if something comes up, then we'll cut it out again and we'll do what we need to do. But my surgeon had already told me, he said, I've gone as deep and as wide as I can go. He said, if I didn't get it this time, he said, I can't go any deeper. Wow. We're going to have to do something different. Wow. So you see how God ordained all of the things and he put all the pieces into place and he took care of all of the things at just the right time because if I hadn't had the weight loss surgery, I wouldn't have realized that was there. We wouldn't have been able to have excess skin to get everything to close (laughs) up. I wouldn't have been able to... You know, go to a ministry training school, you know, in 2008 that I wasn't qualified for, that all these great big pastors from great big churches that had come in from all over the state are at this this pastor's training at Gateway Church, which is a great big church here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex here in Texas. And I went to that ministry, minister's training that they train ministers for. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just a little country girl that's been working with a ministry all these years. And I was able to attend that week-long training. And I was introduced to the Holy Spirit because the little Baptist girl in me had never, you know, the Holy Spirit was something to be afraid of that set up on the shelf at church, at the Baptist church. I didn't know the Holy Spirit wanted to talk to me and wanted me to talk to him. And this was 2021? Well, I went to that training in 2006. Oh, okay. And then I was able to go to another week-long training at that same church again with all ministers a few years later. And then I was able to go to the life coaching class in 2016. And then in April of 2023, I was able to be ordained as a pastor. Wow. And so God's using all of the things that I've shared with you today. He's getting to use all of them to help other people. And I always resented the things that I went through and felt like I was broken. And what God's shown me is the brokenness was the greatest gift he ever gave me. Because the brokenness is what causes me to see things that other people miss in order to help others. And he's made all the brokenness beautiful. Yeah. So all of those things work together for good (laughs) in the process. I am just so, so happy that you are where you are. Your story is incredible. I don't know that it is. It's just, yes, it it is is what it is. It is incredible. It's incredible that you survived through all of this and now you're you know we're in 2023 and you are thriving I mean there are so many points in your story where you could have given up and there were some periods of that that I I felt like God if this is all there is would you take me home Mm -hmm. and when you look at your nightstand and you have medicine that you know if you just took one extra you'd be all right and you'd be in heaven yeah. But that wasn't okay. And you didn't do it. It wasn't okay. I was. I probably was afraid I'd mess it up and I'd be in a worse place than I was. And I didn't want any part of that because mm-hmm. where I was was hard enough. Yeah. I sure didn't want to make it any harder. Yeah. And I know that sounds like a really crazy thing to say, but I mean, that's the honest truth. Because yeah. more than once, I was to that point, I was to the end of my rope. Mm-hmm. And God met me there every time. You know, and I don't advocate for you staying in a place that is dangerous for you. I don't advocate that at all, ever. Abuse is not okay. Forgiveness doesn't mean I push it down. It doesn't mean that didn't hurt. It doesn't mean 
that, you know, forgiveness is for me. It means I'm taking you off of my hook and I'm putting you on God's hook and I'm letting God do whatever he wants to do in the circumstance. And, and I'm just asking him just to do what he needs to do with you and to bless you and to bless me in the process. Mm. And forgiveness is for me. But the reality of it is, is forgiveness doesn't mean necessarily sometimes that you need to be in relationship either. Correct. And especially in a, in a case of trauma and abuse. And I realized in my story that there were several intersections, that there's a whole lot of people out there that would have said, well, if he was going to act like that and he was going to be like that, I would have left him. And honestly and truthfully, I would have been justified in that. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it was, is that while the world might have released me, God did not. And God, God knew that I was strong enough to be there to support Ricky until he came around, until he caught up, and he's catching up. Mm. And I'm thankful, and he's a good man, and we are finally on the same page. And he told me last week, he said, Julie, he says, your daddy loved you. And he said, and your daddy loved people. And I think your daddy would be okay with you sharing your whole story, even the part that was about him, because your daddy loved seeing people be happy. He loves seeing people be whole. He loves seeing people just enjoy life. Mm-hmm. And he loves seeing people love his Jesus. And I'm like, you know, that was powerful. And I needed to hear that. So I want you to know that just because I stayed through some really hard things doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is supposed to stay through some really hard things. Yeah. And there have been tears today, and there have been tender, tender things. And this is the very first time in my entire life of 58 years I'm owning it. Mary Kay always said a woman that'd tell her age would tell anything, so I guess I'll tell anything. (laughs) Um, This is the first time in 58 years that I've been vulnerable and I've shared it all. And I'm willing to just have the pushback and the fallout that will come, because I'm sure there will be some. But if my story changes one person's life or gives one person on this planet hope, all of that's worth it to me. Yeah, that's beautiful. Because it's important. Yeah, hope is important. Hope is our superpower. So there might have been a few tears. Sorry (laughs) about that. No, no, no apologies for tears. Not on this show. Thank you for the space Mm. and holding the space. It's truly my my honor and privilege. I have one question that I do ask all of my guests at the end of the show. Through the lens of your experience, what you've lived through, how do you view compassion? What does it mean to you to be compassionate? I'm pretty sure you know the answer to that. <laughs> God was compassionate with me in all of my stubbornness. Mm. And in all of my things, and everyone deserves someone who sees them and who just holds their space for them and who speaks into their greatness and who calls forth their identity, Mm -hmm. their God-given identity, which is unique and wonderful, and capable, whole, complete, and creative. Well, We all deserve that. Yes, we do. And my greatest hope is that I always try to be Jesus with skin on (laughs) to the people around me. Love that. Julie, thank you so much. I am, I'm honored. I didn't realize that this was the first time you were telling your entire story and I'm, I'm truly honored that you chose to share it with me, with us. And I wish you all, all good things. I'm so happy to hear where you are in life, that you are moving forward with your boundaries in a good place. And um, I can't wait to see what happens next for you because I just, I don't think this is, you know, 
you keep calling yourself old and I think you still got quite a lot of life left in you. I have a lot of life <laughs> left in me and I don't behave very well most of the time and I love having a great time. Good. And so thank you so much. What a blessing you are and what a beautiful, beautiful young lady you are. And I just appreciate your time and all of the things that you've done to make this happen today. Mm. And I, it's fun when we can walk out of shame and regret. Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It's important. It is very important. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Human Experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends and family, share it on social media, and rate and review it on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also support the podcast financially by going to my website, thehxpod.com, linked in the show notes, and clicking on Donate. It takes a lot of time and resources to create this podcast, so every little bit helps. Everyone has a story, and I'd love to hear yours. So be sure to check out the show notes for more information about how to stay in touch. Do good and love well.